It's the Metro on 1019 WDET FM. I'm Tia Graham, and this week, all week, we are joined by the Metro's producer, Sam Corey. Hi, Sam. Hey, Tia. So excited to be here. I'm excited for you to be here as well. You're like... um, you're like the wind beneath my wings. Oh, Tia. Wow. We have such a great a great team here, and this is so cool to be behind the mic. This is just very exciting. It's so exciting. <laughs> so what's the story, Sam Corey? Oh, man. Oh, love that. <laughs> Today on the program, we're talking about what the College for Creative Studies is doing to get its students to partner with local Detroit nonprofits and organizations. Really excited about that conversation. Also... We'll hear about a large complex Ford is building in West Tennessee and why residents want the company to provide housing and to ensure that the environment is kept clean after the complex is built. Really interested to hear about that story yeah. from Stephen Henderson and Created Equal. But first up on the Metro, the Redford Theater has been a longtime fixture in the heart of the Detroit community that it sits in. Just off of Losser and Grand River in Detroit, the theater prides itself on showing unique films to movie buffs all over. James E. Wheeler was a Detroiter and collected 40,000 pieces of black independent film memorabilia, preserving the history of what is known as race films and so much more. This weekend, the Redford Theater will assist the nonprofit, The Black Cannon, by displaying the rare collection of black films dating back to the 1920s. The Black Cannon is hosting its first benefit, Art of the Ages, on Sunday from noon to 4 p.m. It's happening in Livonia, which will include an exhibit and brunch and so much more. Joining the show now to talk more about their involvement with the benefit is John Monahan, a programmer and volunteer at the Detroit, or excuse me, at the Redford Theater in Detroit. John, welcome to the Metro. Hey, thanks for having me back to you. Thank of you. Of course, of mm-hmm. course. And how did this partnership with the Black Cannon come together? Did they reach out to you or? Yeah, well, it all starts with my friendship with James Wheeler, yeah. who is uh, sort of a well-known figure in Detroit, really, for the last 40 or 50 years uh, as an activist, as a collector, as a uh, involved in theater um, activist. He's he, he's an amazing, um, mm. great friend of mine. He was uh, he passed about three years ago, mm. and his uh, kids, Ali and Alima, um, have been tasked with they've they've taken on this amazing project of cataloging and and preserving all the stuff that he collected over the years. And I'm talking about a lot of stuff. Mm. This is a warehouse that's filled. I compare it to that scene at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark. (laughs) Maybe a little smaller, but it's just, it's full of um, books and records and posters and magazines, toys, dolls, photos, and a lot of 16 millimeter film. So I've been helping them try to kind of make sense of all that film um, so that they can kind of pare it down to the best of it um, especially that's related to to Black history, and there's plenty of it. There's so what we're doing this weekend, um, and this is through a little group that I run called the Motor City Cinema Society, which is part of the Redford Theater. Um, we 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 use space that they provide to show 16 millimeter films. Films on film is our big passion, and from the money that we earn from these Monday screenings, we show movies every Monday. We're able to fund 35 millimeter film screenings in the big house at the Redford Theater next door. So I know this is all very confusing, but the the 16 millimeter wing of my organization um, has joined with um, with the Wheelers uh, for this um, event this Sunday, which yeah. I'm super excited mm-hmm. about. And for two hours, we're going to be screening some of the rare things that I found in this archive. Mm-hmm. We're going to be showing about maybe 15 reels of things. Wow. And they're just amazing. Some of it's real familiar. Like we're going to show clips from, say, Stormy Weather or the Pam Greer film Foxy Brown. Yeah. Or mm. we'll show, um, you know, trailers uh, from uh, films of the 50s through the 70s. But it's this real oddball stuff that I've unearthed there that I'm most excited to share with people during during this uh, this event. So, John, uh, just having the relationship you had with James Wheeler, I, what were some of the things or some of the ways that he explained how he collected some of the thing, his memorabilia? Was he just searching mm. for them or did it just fall? Like, you know, what yeah. was happening? Well, it was a little bit of both. And, and we kind of shared that passion, obsession, madness <laughs> that comes from collecting. <laughs> and a lot of the stuff was especially black film related material, especially in the 60s, 70s, 80s, was not considered to have much value. Mm. So a lot of that just sort of fell, you know, he was known as somebody that would um, collect this stuff. And we would go to film conventions where they'd sell film posters and movies and stuff, and they would know James is the guy that wanted this stuff. So 
we would go together to these conventions and, uh, and we would have the car just filled with stuff because people from all over the country would bring stuff to him yeah. um, knowing that he, that he wanted this material. And then when I was working, um, you know, writing about film at the, at the Free Press, um, you know, the press kits, the, uh, anything related to black film would go his way. So yeah. he was known as a receptacle of all this stuff. And I don't know where this stuff was stored to, to fill this huge warehouse oh, yeah. now. Um, I do know, actually, because I, I was at his house when he lived in Detroit. It was in his basement? It was. It was in his basement. <laughs> it was in the attic. It was on the first floor. It was everywhere. Um, and I, he might have had storage. He must have had storage units. But um, mm-hmm. anyways, uh, it, it's quite an undertaking, and I'm really proud to be part of it. And I, I'm so glad the family has done what they've done, which is not throw anything out so yeah. that, that they can really take their time to go through it. And that's why they need, uh, you know, this benefit that's happening on Sunday is so important to keep that work going. Mm, that is so like I just want to know so much more about James. But if you're just tuning in, we're chatting with John Monahan from the Redford Theater about the work do, uh, they're doing right now to preserve old films, especially the work they're doing with the Black Cannon and the James Wheeler and, and his family. Um, so you're speaking about working with his kids, and they're 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 they have a large task ahead of them to they preserve sure everything, mm-hmm. and they are doing this benefit. This is the first benefit they're going to be doing under the Black Cannon. Um, if you could just talk about the benefit itself just a little bit, and then the importance of having the preservation of this of this memorabilia because like you said it was seen as something that wasn't important it was seen as something that it was just a castaway or a throwaway Mm -hmm. so the importance of preservance especially with the detroit perspective i mean amazing so this event happens from noon to four there will be food provided um, and drinks and there'll be one room that'll be set up with some of his collection some of the physical pieces and then again we'll be showing two hours in in a block um, my friend Nick Pabutsky, another member of the Motor City mm-hmm. Cinema Society, he and I, he's a master projectionist, will be showing these uh, at the event so people can t- can take in some of that stuff. So th- that's that's how it, how it goes. And it's at this place called Tailored Garden in Livonia, which is right around 8 Mile and, and Grand um, River, not far from the Redford Theater. Yeah, yeah, that is so, 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 so cool. So as we continue on, I mean, I remember we were chatting just a little bit earlier about film and preserving film. And we also had uh, another filmmaker who passed away recently, Roger Corman, recently died. He was a Detroit native. And once you brought mm-hmm. his name up, I went and looked him up as well. And I said, oh, my gosh, we know so many of his films. Yeah, he's Silence one of my of idols. The Lamb? Uh, well, he had you know, he helped Jonathan Demme early yeah. on. And that's why. You know, Jonathan Demme has a career. What a lot of people know Roger Corman for was all the careers that he fostered through mm-hmm. the years. I mean, people like Francis Coppola and Peter Bogdanovich, Martin Scorsese would probably not be who they are if it wasn't for getting that early work from Roger Corman. But what we're focused on uh, for the next couple of weeks at the Motor City Cinema Society and the Redford yeah. is, is, is Corman's own filmography. And so there's some real gems in there, especially when he mixed horror and comedy. So tonight... At 7 o'clock at the Motor City Cinema Society, which is the small 50-seat screening room next to the theater, um, the big theater, we're going to be showing Bucket of Blood, which is one of my favorite all-time horror comedies. Sounds gory. It It, does. It's hilarious. It's from 1959. It's very similar to the movie Little Shop of Horrors, Mm -hmm. which we're showing at the big theater on the weekend. But it's about a, um, a guy that works in a coffee house uh, in a beatnik coffee house in the 1950s, and he's really he idolizes all the people that perform there and wants to be part of the scene, and then ends up accidentally murdering a cat and enc- encasing it in um, uh, like he makes a sculpture out of it, mm. and it turns into this big art art. You know, it's this amazing artist now, <gasps> and he feels then he f- finds out he's got to continue to keep killing, and to keep his art going. Wow. Oh, wow. Um, but it's a real, it lands. sounds funny. It's, it is. It is. It's darkly funny. <laughs> yeah. And this was something that he kind of leaned into around this time. Mm. He had made movies, real low budget movies in the mid fifties with great success. And then this one was one of the famous ones because he shot it so quickly, he shot it in like five days. Wow. Um, and it, it turned into a minor cult film, but the film he followed it up with, which is little shop of horrors I that mean. everybody knows. Um, which is a very totally. similar story, <laughs> you know, about a guy that that kind of invents a, a plant that becomes a man-eating plant. Mm-hmm. That's that's famous, of course, the musical version. I needed space. that though because I don't know that much about film, uh, so I appreciate that. So yeah. we're throwing yeah. that little p- piece in there for I you. It. I need yeah, it. we're yeah, helping out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, we yeah, can lift me up here. <laughs> well, come to these because they're it's a real nice introduction to Corman. And what's cool about Corman is Detroit-born, right? Yeah. He's here until about age ten, I think, and then he goes to Beverly, he goes to Beverly Hills High, and he's you know in California the rest of his life. Life. Mm. And he works real closely with this 
at um, American International Pictures, and then in the 80s, New World Pictures, where he does a lot of producing. And that's where people like Jonathan Demme come out of there yeah. and Joe Dante. He, he, uh, re- he's, a lot of people got their start with him. And I love that that's one of the things that Detroit's known for. And, and those who are from the city of Detroit, they tend to be mentors to others. They tend to guide mm. others and help others and to, you know, to be what they're going to be, which is amazing to hear that he has that connection as well. That's yeah. what he did. Mm. So then Saturday we're showing a 35 millimeter film print, an original release print of Little Shop at, at two o'clock, followed by a movie he made in 1963 called The Raven which is super fun. It was a number of... He made eight films based on Edgar Allan Poe, Mm -hmm. and um, they often incorporated humor, and this is, I think, the best. Um, It's got Vincent Price in it, Boris Karloff, and Peter Lorre, and a super young Jack Nicholson. Mm -hmm. So he's really responsible in a big part for Jack Nicholson's career, too. He appears both in Little Shop of Horrors and in The Raven. Yeah, Mm. but... I don't even know where to begin with that. I love films and talking about films so much right now. If you're joining us, once again, we're chatting with John Monaghan from the Redford Theater. And we're about to get into a little bit of the Halloween season you guys have going on at the Redford Theater. I know it's a huge, it's spooky, it's spooky season. This is our big month. This in December really pays a lot of bills. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, and we've got a great lineup. We've got everything. We've got stuff for kids. We've got everything from, you know, we got everything from The Raven to Clockwork Orange. You know, we've also got It Follows which I'm in love with. And of course, the opening of that film is shot at the Redford Theater. So it brings chills, right? Lots of interest in seeing It Follows Again, which which celebrates its 10th anniversary this mm. year. And It Follows scared me really good. So I don't watch it often <laughs> because it scared me really good. You know, we have two classic horror films that are Redford related and we're showing Evil Dead in 16 millimeter yeah. in the middle of October. And that's the most famous film. I mean, to, I, I think to come out of Detroit, right? And it was... Yeah. It would had its premiere at the Redford Theater. Both it and Evil Dead Two had their first screenings ever at the Redford Theater. Wow! So cool. I, can, can you talk a little bit? You know, we don't have that much more time, but but I do want to ask you about the importance of small theaters because a lot of them have been going away oh, in, tell me in the it. Detroit area. Yeah. And I, I'm just wondering if you could, I don't know, marinate on that a little bit. Oh, you know it. I mean, uh, we're really trying to fill that gap that's been left by the loss of the Maine and the Maple. I mm-hmm. mean, that's huge, yeah. huge loss to the community, of yeah. course. You know, Detroit Film Theater's still doing their thing. Senate's still doing their thing. We're doing ours. Senate's leaning into the cult films, which I really appreciate. Mm-hmm. And we still focus on the classic Hollywood with a smattering of cult you know, just quality film, and our focus, at least mine, uh, is to show film on film whenever possible. Mm. And these old film prints. To me, it's can, all part can, of yeah, that Can experience. you explain that a little bit? For most yeah, film? we okay. So most films, all films, are shown digitally right now. Mm-hmm. You know, just digital projection. Right. But we love to show film on film. It's the way it was meant to be seen. It was the way it was created. And we do that in 16 millimeter, a small format, in the little screening room. And whenever possible, we show 35 millimeter in the big house, our 1600 seat theater. Mm -hmm. So upcoming, we have Little Shop of Horrors on Saturday in our original release 1960 print. And then we have a really beautiful, recently struck print of A Clockwork Orange on October 18 Mm -hmm. in the big house. Mm -hmm. Um, So again, whenever we can get a hold of that, people really appreciate it, I think, this authentic experience of seeing a film the way it was made and mm-hmm. presented originally. It is. It's a really, really a unique experience. And I think you all, if you are interested, should definitely take advantage of it. And the one thing I really wanted to note that with the the flyer for the for the films that you all have listed here for the Redford Theater, the ones that say not for kids, that that's for me. That's printed for me. So, you know, <laughs> the not for kids one's definitely printed for me. I'm not gonna, <laughs> not gonna take your nieces. No, yeah, no, we're not doing that one at all. But I wanna say once again, thank you so much to John Monahan, the manager of the excuse me, a volunteer and a programmer of the Redford Theater, because all of those who work at the Redford Theater are volunteers. Yes. And um, just one point about the event this weekend. Yes. You can get tickets for that through Eventbrite, black dash canon C A N O N dot com for that um, that event for the Black Cannon. That's, Thank you. That is it indeed. We're going to bring that up. The theater is teaming up with the Black Cannon, which is hosting its first benefit, Art of the Ages. It will include an exhibit, a brunch, and we will also get to see two hours of rare films that will be showcased during that uh, event. It's happening from noon to 4 p.m. at Taylor Garden in Livonia. For more information, head to Eventbrite for those tickets. Thank you so much, John. Thank you. Metro.
Metro on 1019 WDETFM. I am Tia Graham here with Sam Corey. Hey, and Tia. Sam, you know, I'm excited about uh, we have some uh, good weather coming up. That's right. That's right. Today, 65 degrees and sunny. Tuesday, 65 degrees and sunny. Wednesday, 66 degrees and sunny. We're doing we're doing pretty well. We're doing okay. I think we're doing okay. <laughs> you, want it, you want it higher. You, you want it higher. You, you want know, it lower. for this time of year, I think that is pretty darn good. I agree. I think it's pretty darn good. Do you know what else is pretty darn good? What's that? The Tigers play the Guardians in Game 2 Woo-hoo! of the American League Division Series this afternoon. It's a duel of left-handed pitchers. Tariq Scoble starts for Detroit. Super excited about Lefties. this. I'm hoping that we get a win. Yeah, we lost I'm, the other day. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't great. Wasn't no, pretty. No. We were but, on a streak. But. We, uh, you know, you know, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. Fingers crossed. Coming up, though, we'll talk about why residents in West Tennessee are excited about a new Ford complex that's coming to their area and the other investments they believe the company should be making. You all stay right there. Welcome back to the Metro on 1019 WDETFM. I'm Tia Graham. And I'm Sam Corey. Yes, you are. <laughs> the rural landscape of West Tennessee is undergoing a massive change right now. That's because Ford is building a blue oval city complex that spans six square miles and ex- is expected to bring 6,000 jobs to the area. Many states want that kind of economic investment, including a number of Michigan officials. But some residents in Tennessee are asking Ford to adopt a community benefits agreement to provide better housing and to maintain clean air and clean water for residents in the area. Last week on Created Equal, Stephen Henderson spoke with members of the group Blue Oval Good Neighbors while they visited Detroit to advocate for a community benefits agreement. Shannon Whitfield is a resident of Mason, Tennessee. She's also a member of the group Blue Oval Good Neighbors. And Rebecca Gorbea is the statewide coordinator for Tennessee for All. Here's a clip of them discussing why residents want to be a bigger part of the Blue Oval City project. I'm really uh, struck by the enthusiasm you all have for what Ford is doing. You're not saying, hey, don't build this or don't try to create the opportunity. You're saying, make us part of it. Make us a part of the decision-making process. But I, I do want to talk about the flip side of that, which is what would you lose if this is not changed in a way that includes you more? Shannon, I'll start with you this time. Thank you. We are hearing from our neighbors in our many town hall meetings that they are fearful of all the change coming, as we all can potentially be. Um, Some of the fears revolve around being able to stay in the area. You know, it's really, it's a scary thing to be priced out of your family's land and, you know, your ancestral at this point place to be, you know? Um, When we think about how people, especially the black population, ended up in West Tennessee, Mm -hmm. we feel a real connection to Detroit because everybody didn't end up, a lot of people went on. Sure. But... You know, we already mentioned Tent City. You know, the the history of the that county, those counties in that area, leaves the citizens with a doubt that their concerns will be addressed. Um, I feel like that's been the experience of the citizens of West Tennessee. Um, since we started talking about things, I mean, for hundreds of years now. Mm-hmm. And every time something comes along that's supposed to help, somebody else seems to profit off it. And when I look at these people, I'm a white woman. When I look at these people, they're all white like me. The and people who are benefiting. Who are benefiting, yes, sir. Like I said, when I first moved there, it seemed so magical to me because, you know, 
here's that mythical place where the races get along. <laughs> I mean, it felt that, like I said, I was naive, <laughs> but that was my treatment and in my experience until I started learning more about the politics of the area. And the history, sure. Yes, sir. And I'm still learning a lot about the history. Miss mm-hmm. Eloise is helping me with that. <laughs> um, she has a passion for it. The people in our area, they work hard, you know, and they want to guarantee that their descendants have the opportunity to work hard. You know, and to to make it in a more easily definable way. Mm -hmm. That excitement that we felt when Ford first made their announcements um, gave some hope. We need to make sure that our citizens still feel that hope. And currently, I'll speak for myself, it was hard to get information on what was going on around us. A lot of people yeah. have both the historic fear. It'd be nice to see a little proof, some some more good faith, and mm-hmm. have things in writing. Uh, Rebecca, I want to give you a chance to address the same question, but also just to, to outline exactly what it is that you're asking for, What exactly what Ford could do to, to address these fears that the members of the community have. Yes. So we've held 24 town halls in the past two years. We've gathered 800 signatures. We've talked to hundreds of residents. And these are the issues that we want to see a community benefits agreement address. We've already talked at length about housing, but the positive vision of that is affordable housing units, is community land trusts, is uh, uh, maybe a fund to support people who are evicted because they cannot pay the uh, increasing rent on their home. So that's one thing. That's for housing. Uh, The environment, one of the things that we want to see is an independent auditor that is able to audit the impacts to the air, water, and ecology uh, every year and to provide that information to community members as well as some standards um, or at least transparency on how we are going to be disposing of the lithium batteries and how that's going to impact our aquifer. Um, So that's uh, the environmental standards. We want to see that in a CBA as much as we can. So the other thing that's also there is um, local hire. So Tennessee or Blue Oval has committed to hiring 6,000 people. And we want to make sure that a percentage of that 6,000 is coming from people in the West Tennessee region. Um, We also want to make sure we cannot put this in a contract due to the uh, policies in Tennessee, but we would love for those jobs to be good union paying jobs. The other, we've kind of been talking about the preservation of culture and history in the area area. And to us, what that looks like is more community investment. So where we have the local hire environment and housing, we also want to see more community centers. So I would say it's a number of things, but. And and what has Ford's response been so far? So uh, that's a good question. Ford invited Tennessee for all to their blue table um, a year or two ago, and we brought up the community benefits agreement. Uh, They said they were interested. They met with us maybe two times. And then from then on, they started to ghost us because they said they were concerned about the legally binding portion of a community benefits agreement. But like Shannon and Eloise stated, That part is actually very important, especially to black residents who have seen, uh, you know, promises broken. Promises broken, exactly. So they want something in writing that, you know, that gravity can't be overstated enough. It will. Okay. That was Rebecca Gorbea, the statewide coordinator for Tennessee for All, and Shannon Whitfield, a resident of Mason, Tennessee, and a member of the advocacy group Blue Oval Good Neighbors. WDT reached out to Ford for their perspective on the manor, and we received the following statement. Ford and Ford Philanthropy are committed to our community initiatives because we want residents in every community neighboring Blue Oval City to benefit as the campus comes to life. The company says it will introduce its community benefits agreement plan to residents. It's 
It's the Metro on 1019 WDET FM. I'm Tia Graham. Just heard from Sam Corey. Quick look at the weather sunny and a temperature in the high 60s all week long. Friday's nah. going to be 73, so I'm excited about that, but all week. Not Beautiful. bad. Not bad at all. And more good news. The Pistons opened the NBA's preseason by beating the Milwaukee Bucks 120 to 87 at the Little Caesars Arena. Pretty good. Pretty good after last season. Look, my hands are up. I'm expecting (laughs) anything from the Pistons this year. Honestly, they can't be any worse than last year. They can be. Technically, right. They can't go anywhere but up with the Pistons at this point. So I'll take anything they give. Literally anything they give. I'll take it What's coming up, Sam? (laughs) Coming up on the Metro, we'll talk about a new Detroit shop that's offering its customers more than just crafted goods. We'll get into all that next. The Metro on 1019 WDET FM. I'm Tia Graham here with Sam Corey. Sam, how's it going? I'm doing pretty well. How are you, Tia? I'm okay. Yeah. Just, just okay. okay. Just okay. Just okay. You know, know sometimes well. that's, that's fine. That's it, fine. Yeah. You know, coffee maybe needs to kick in a little bit. All right. But all it's right. about to get better. Okay. It's about Tell to get why. so much better because one former Detroit Public Schools community district teacher, she didn't want to lose her love of educating others. So once she transitioned from an elementary school teacher, she decided to open Vessi Lane Goods. The small business sells crafted goods and personalized items, but the space means more to her than material goods. No pun intended. She wants to craft a space for artists and other educators to connect and grow a community. With two gallery walls in the store, there are traveling exhibits and artists and author talks, including one this Saturday from 2 to 3.30 p.m. with author Jean Alicia Elster. And she will give a talk and a book signing at the store this weekend. Joining us now in studio is the owner of Vessi Lane Goods, Robin Wilson. Robin, welcome to the Metro. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. I mean, your whole vibe, everything about you is just like, I want to be in her space. Yeah. I want to be in Robin's space. So what does the name Vessi Lane Goods mean? So the name comes from my maternal family line. My great-grandfather and great-grandmother were Narvel and uh, Burl V.C., and VC. Thank you. It's yeah. VC Lane Goods. Yeah. Make sure you always correct me, man. That's yes. okay. No, you're okay. And, you know, I while I didn't have a chance to know my great grandfather, I very much had an opportunity to know my great grandmother. And I come from a long line of creatives and entrepreneurs. And so, in part, my company is a way for me to continue that legacy within my family, but it's also a way for me to share my creativity and to really engage with the community that I love. I love I, I love that. And just thinking about you pivoting from uh, being a full time educator to a business owner. But then you, you thought to yourself, I want to do more than own a business that sells goods. So when you're transitioning out of becoming a full time educator into a full time entrepreneur, what were some of your thoughts, especially trying to incorporate education and, and, and creative passions in your work? Well, before we actually move into our brick and mortar, um, different organizations that I have worked with in the past would invite me to come and lead different uh, creative workshops. And so I knew that I wanted to continue that even in the physical space that we're in now. And as you mentioned, my background is in education. And so I've also worked in the nonprofit sector. So even though VC Lane Goods is a for-profit business, I knew that I wanted to still engage the community. And so one of the ways that I do that is by hosting creative uh, workshops in the space, allowing individuals to even rent out the space for more intimate community gatherings. This past Friday, we actually did our first um, collage making workshop in the space. Mm. <laughs> and uh, we had a family who came and, you know, it was not just a great opportunity to teach them how to make collages, but we shared stories. I learned about their family. And so there was some community building that happened. Mm. Yeah. I 
haven't heard collage making in so long. It just felt me with so much nostalgia. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. So just thinking about VC Lane and VC Lane Goods and your creation of it, I know as well, I read that you had health scares that kind of really made you look around at yourself and look around at the things that you were doing. So how did your your health scare and then ultimately your overcoming that health scare lead you to where you are now? Mm. Absolutely. Well, I'm thankful to be 40 years old. <laughs> um, mm. And I say that because, you know, sometimes I don't I don't think of 40 as being old. No. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think that sometimes when we're younger, we have all of these plans and big dreams and there's nothing wrong with having big dreams and having plans but the reality is that tomorrow's not promised to any of us Mm -hmm. and I just that really um that really sat with me when I had an ischemic stroke three years ago I was vegan I went to the gym and I worked out I did not have high blood pressure I'm a (laughs) non-smoker so all of the risk factors that you would think that would contribute to you having a stroke, I did not have those. And so it was a surprise for me when my doctors told me that I had had a stroke. Mm. But instead of making me fearful and instead of getting stuck, it really made me go and kind of go into overdrive (laughs) because I, I was just really determined not only to make the most of of that space that I was in at that time. Rest, yes, but it was like, okay, the things that I had been putting off, I did not want to put them off any longer. Mm. And I haven't stopped because um, I knew that I needed a different pace, but I also knew that I still wanted to teach and work within the community. And so thankfully, I have a supportive family and a community surrounding me. So I was able to make that transition from teaching full time in the elementary school classroom to starting my business and now growing it to this point. And I mean, I know Sam wants to come in here. I mean, three years, like that's, you've done a lot in three years from having your your stroke and your health scare to now. I mean, that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit, Raman, about, you know, um, why this particular business, what you sell and and like why, why that was important to you. Absolutely. So I'm an artist and I've always uh, been an artist, but I knew that I wanted to create my own greeting cards. And instead of waiting for someone to discover my greeting cards, I decided that I was going to take them to the local market days. Mm. And so that's exactly what I did. I thought that, you know what, I can see how they go over with people at local market days. And then from there, I started getting orders online. (laughs) People started sending me messages on on social media. Mm -hmm. And someone um, invited me to come to the Detroit uh, Artist Breakfast Club. And there I met many other artists and my cards auctioned um, at the Detroit Fine Arts Breakfast Club. Mm. And I met a gallerist at one of those meetings and he actually invited me to sell my cards in the Ellen K. Rod Gallery gift shop. So literally it was progressive yeah. from market days to where we are now with our brick and mortar. It was a graduation of of different opportunities that really opened up over time. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, why greeting cards and like why those things matter? You know, we, we live now so much more online than we used to. A lot of things are digitized. Mm-hmm. Um, why why does having that that physical material matter and and, and I guess, what does that do? What does that do for you? What do you think that does for others? Well, you know, I have always been sentimental. <laughs> so Same. I actually have... Uh, You're talking to Saps here. We're yes. absolute Saps. <laughs> you know, I have, I have cards that were given to me when I was in high school. Now, they're not still on display in my house, but I have a special place where I keep those cards. And some of the individuals who have given me those cards are no longer living. Mm. So to a great degree... Uh, they're keepsakes for me. And I think that because I treasure uh, things that 
people give me, especially things that they've made. <laughs> There's something timeless about handmade, handcrafted items. Yeah. And so when I'm making my greeting cards, I think that people who buy them, they see the love and they see the care <laughs> that I've put into making the cards. And I've actually had individuals say, oh, I'm not giving this card away. I'm going to frame it or I'm going to keep it for myself. So that actually gave me the idea of starting to frame my greeting cards and selling them that way, too. Um, but to go back to your question, um, I think that there's just something priceless about giving someone a well-crafted gift. And we do live in a time where it's like you might get a thank you via email, you might not. But I think that it's it's classy to, to give a thank you card. And still today, it sets you apart. And um, and I think that, you know, even for the companies that I've worked with and design branded greeting cards for them, I think they see that. <laughs> they understand that, that if you really want to make a statement, give someone a, a card and it will they will remember it for years to come. <laughs> I love the card that I'm holding in my hands right now. Can you you just talked about the framing, yeah. and I'm just like, I'm going to frame this card. Mm-hmm. But it's three beautiful black women. Looks like they're from the 1940s, That's maybe? right. In a 1940s attire, their hair, the dresses, the shoes, the Mary Janes looks like as well. And it says, sis, in the background, it's like a, a cheetah print almost. That's and right. it's absolutely gorgeous. I'm not going to be using this or sending this away. <laughs> this is going to be at home sitting on my mantle. So thank you very much. You are welcome. So green cards can be used for a lot of different things. Oh, yeah. And is that Exactly. It's going to be something that you can just look at when you walk into my house. Like, what's that? Oh, here's the story behind this. Yes. But before I let you go, 30 seconds or less, we just want to talk about VC Lane Goods. Of course, it's a place, uh, it's a for-profit, but I want you to talk about it as a gathering space, being a third space and how you want it to be a communal space for creatives and educators alike. Absolutely. Well, as I mentioned earlier, I'm an artist and I'm a part of the Amber Collective here in Detroit. And so um, that's one example of collaboration my Amber sisters, their artwork is currently hanging in in my store. And we actually have a closing artist talk that's coming up on Tuesday, October the 29th. And you can come and you can hear their stories about their artwork and why they created it. But um, it is a gathering place because it's a place where artists and the community can come and they can congregate. And, yes. and enjoy. I, I need one more question. Oh, just, oh, I yeah. know, just 30 <laughs> seconds. I just like, said this a little bit. What's the key to writing a great card? Like, how do you do it? Ooh. That's a great question. It, is. It, it I say that it comes from the heart. Mm-hmm. Like, what comes from the heart reaches the heart. And so don't try to be pretentious. Don't try to sound poetic. Just say what you're thinking and mm-hmm. what's on your heart. And then put it in writing. That's what I think makes an excellent greeting. Ooh. That's beautiful. Right. I'm going to start writing handwritten letters I again d- to uh, folks. I do it for my family members. I do it, I do it for friends. Too. Let's I do see. this. Yeah. Okay, Robin, you got us in a, a new mood. We're, we're writing cards to people. Robin Wilson yeah. is the owner of VC Lane Goods. This weekend, she's hosting an author book talk and signing with Jean Alicia Elster. Robin, thank you so much for joining us on the Metro. Looking forward to hearing all the cool things that you all have. And thank you so much for bringing us some keepsakes. You're welcome. You're thank welcome. You. Thank you for having me. It's the Metro on 1019 WDETFM. I'm feeling so uplifted and good right now after that conversation. I really want to go send some some beautiful letters to folks right now. Like, that's just what I want to do. Spread some love. Yeah. Man. Uh, uh, I know. Such a, it's such a valuable uh, such a valuable thing to do. It's such, it a, it's such a valuable way to spend time. Let people know how you feel and how you love them. Gratitude. 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 Coming up, we'll discuss why the College for Creative Studies is having its students partner with local nonprofits around Detroit. Detroit. Stay right there. It's the Metro on 1019 WDET FM. I'm Tia Graham. And I'm Sam Corey. 
The College for Creative Studies in Detroit teaches artists and creatives. That's kind of their thing. And many of those students go on to work and make art locally. Mm -hmm. To expand those relationships, the college launched its Practicing Design Center at the end of September. It's meant to not only provide work experience for students, but also advance design efforts for Detroit nonprofits and organizations. To talk about that new project now, we're joined by Olga Stella, CCS Vice President of Strategy and Communications. Olga, welcome to the Metro. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here with us. So tell us, what is the Practicing Design Center and why did the College for Creative Studies launch it? The Practicing Design Center is a new um, effort within the college to really help uh, pair nonprofit organizations and small businesses with our students and faculty. We have been working um, with uh, companies and nonprofits in our classrooms for many, many years. In fact, um, over 200 companies just since 2017. But for nonprofits to participate, uh, there's a lot of barriers in the way that we've structured this. And so we've set up this center to really um, streamline the process for nonprofits and small businesses to get access to our students and our faculty. Also make it easier for um, you know, the folks who are doing big initiatives in town, whether it's around early, early childhood um, initiatives or housing, you know, who want um, design students and, and art and design faculty to be part of that, to connect with us. Um, and then finally, um, to give our students a much more consistent way to work uh, with nonprofits and small businesses. That's the kind of work our students want to do. Um, This generation especially, you know, is Mm. very um, uh, social impact minded. Mm. And um, we really wanted to make sure that we were providing the kinds of real life opportunities that they that they want that are meaningful to them um, while also making an impact with the really important um, nonprofits and small businesses to make Detroit you know what it is today yeah so tell us you know what are the kinds of organizations that uh, are your partners and then what are some of the things that students will be will be doing yeah so um, in the past we've worked with organizations like um, class uh, forgotten harvest um, Inside Out, Literary Arts, Life Remodeled, um, COTS. Those are just the examples of some of the organizations um, that worked with us in our, in our prior model. And for, um, in those cases, you know, the, the, we had a, um, a funding partner, sometimes the Gilbert Family Foundation or Mercedes-Benz Financial Services, that supported a 15-week classroom project. And um, through our new center, we'll still be able to do that. Um, and just offer a more streamlined way for a much larger group of nonprofits to apply to participate so that we can kind of build that pipeline of classroom projects um, into the future. Mm -hmm. But we'll also have some resources so students can do internships. So a great example is with Life Remodeled. We had a classroom project where the students worked on um, really the the brand for Life Remodeled and um, and how that brand, you know, connected to its work going forward and really provided a, um, um, some very um, uh, tangible, actionable um, brand frameworks that Life or Model ultimately um, selected one and implemented it. And now through the Practicing Design Center, they have two students who will be interning at Life or Model this fall to help, you know, continue to build out that work but as interns as opposed to in the classroom project. So that's the kind of thing that we want to be able to do. Short design sprints, you know, which would be, you know, a little shorter bursts, more intensive problem solving, the 15-week classroom projects, and then the interns placed within uh, these nonprofit organizations. Yeah. What are some of the lessons that those students learned from the Life Remodeled project and and some of the other partnerships that that have happened between CCS and, and local nonprofits? Yeah, when all of these projects, the students end up doing a lot of research. I think um, most people don't understand how much research goes into an art or a design project. Mm. The students really end up learning a lot about the community, learning a lot about the organization, um, and, and also scanning for, you know, other, you know, national best practices, exemplars, that kind of thing. Um, they get real-world feedback. You know, they hear mm. directly from the clients um, or the um, the staff, you know, at the organization. So, for example, this uh, last year they worked with CLASS, uh, which is a nonprofit in northwest Detroit that does a lot of substance abuse prevention and counseling for families. They got to work with young people who are, um, you know, served by CLASS 
um, and hear directly from them on the project that they were working on. So they get to really get the, the feedback and the critique um, directly from um, the people who are impacted. Yeah. And so it just it gives them that real life experience so that it's a, like a, a client, um, you know, uh, service relationship where they can then they can take that, you know, into their um, careers as they move forward. How does that shape their art and their creations? I mean, I, I guess, you know. Art is an expression. There's so much that goes into it, and it seems like design is that way, too. I'm wondering how that collaboration and that getting of feedback shifts and changes and shapes, I guess, the way they see the world and then the outputs, the things that they make in the world. Yeah, that was a great question. And and many of the projects we've done really are design projects. And so you are, you're, of course, you're bringing your you know opinions, your thoughts, your perspective to that work, but in design, you end up being constrained by uh, whatever the parameters are of the brief, you know, what the client has said is their problem and working together to um, shape what that problem statement is. And I think one of the things that's a growth opportunity for our students when they're doing this work um, in partnership with community is that they're expanding their understanding of what the problems are that, that um, we are facing in Detroit. And they're learning from the people who are working on the ground. So you might, you know, read newspaper articles or have your opinions about, you know, what community development looks like in Detroit or homelessness or, um, you know, education. But until you actually heard from and worked hand in hand with the people who are working on the ground, um, you might not have all the facts. And so that's, that's what the students, they're tempering and they're learning how to um, uh, adapt their own perspectives um, and experiences they're bringing with the experiences of others. And it's a very, very important skill for um, an artist or a designer to have as they yeah. go forward because you want the things you do to be meaningful and meaningful to the people who are experiencing them. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, you know, there's it's a skill that has to be learned. Right. It's a different way of making meaning, doing it in person and, and, and directly with people. If you're just joining us, we're speaking with Olga Stella. She's the vice president of strategy and communications at the College for Creative Studies. And we're talking about what the school is doing to connect students with designers, uh, uh, student designers, excuse me, with local nonprofits. I, I guess uh, uh, last question for you, Olga, because we're just running out of time. How can organizations apply to be a part of the Practicing Design Center program? Well, we invite them to visit our website at hire.ccsdetroit.edu and go to the Practicing Design Center uh, page. There's an application process that's open through November 1st. We're very lucky that we've been funded by Ford Philanthropy um, for this first round of projects and and are really looking forward to um, seeing the kinds of, of needs that nonprofits have in our community, as well as small businesses. We traditionally haven't been able to work with small businesses as much as we would like. And, and so we just really invite nonprofits and small business owners in Detroit um, to take a look at hire.ccsdetroit.edu and um, let us know what kinds of problems you're trying to solve, and we'll see if we can get our students to help you solve them. Yeah, well, hopefully you'll be able to partner with some small businesses. Olga, Olga Stella, thank you so much for joining us on the Metro. Thanks for having me. That is the Metro for Monday, October 7th. You can listen to recent episodes online at WDET.org and make sure to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. The show is also on YouTube if you like listening that way. The show is produced by me, David Lyons, Jack Philbrand, and Dorothy Jones. Our engineer is Nate Bender. Music by Sam Bobin, uh, Sam Bobin and Will Sessions. You know, when I just read that, I forgot I was also one of the producers You're of the also show. T- I was producer reading and I said, also you know, T-Gram. I should probably put that in there, too. Also yeah. Production of WDET. Listener supported of Wayne State University. If you want to support the Metro, consider becoming a member at WDET.org slash donate. This is WDETFM, Detroit Public Radio, your connection to news, music, and conversation. We will return tomorrow.